My name is Jerry Gill. Today is September 18th, 2009. I'm visiting with Bill, Dr. Bill Taggart uh, at First United Methodist Church in Stillwater, Oklahoma. Uh, this interview is for the O State Stories Project, which is part of the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program. Bill, thanks for taking time this morning to be with us. I'm honored. Uh, we're, we're looking forward to knowing it's going to be an interesting interview because we, we've shared some stories before. Uh, just wanted to kind of, first of all, start maybe at the beginning. Can you tell me a little bit about where you grew up, you know, a little bit about your family, your early life, some things you remember early in your, in your life? I was born in Missouri, as you noted on that document. Mm -hmm. But my parents moved to western Oklahoma and homesteaded before I was a year old. Mm -hmm. So I've been called a native Oklahoman quite a few years of my life. Where, whereabouts was that, Bill? Way out in Cimarron County in western Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And we lived through the drought and the dust bowl and all that out there. And I think the thing that cured most of that was World War II because of the demand for agriculture and we had rain. Mm -hmm. And both of those things put together helped the country mm -hmm. in spite of the fact that it was a war. Where, where did you go to high school, Bill? Was it? It was a little rural country school called Plainview, mm -hmm. north of Texoma between there and Boy City, Oklahoma. What's your expression? It's not the end of the world, but you can see it from there. <laughs> <laughs> Almost. <laughs> Well, I, I lettered on the uh, basketball team mm -hmm. all four years, but there's only seven of us went out to play. <laughs> you had to be careful about fouling out, didn't you? <laughs> didn't have guys finish the game. Well, we, outdoor court, we didn't have any indoor. Uh, well, Bill, what, tell a little bit about your family in the Depression. I guess there were some pretty tough times out there. What, what are your, some of your early memories about that? So you grew up in the, basically in the, in the thir uh, 20s and 30s? Actually, uh, the worst thing was the dust storm years, but our family didn't have, we weren't a big farm area like a lot of the people were, but <clears throat> we had a real good crop in 1929, and the price dropped to, oh, just a little nothing, 25 cents a bushel for wheat crop, and cattle prices were extremely low. And then also, uh, in 1930, we had a good crop, but still cheap, but it all hailed out. Mm -hmm. So we went into that Dust Bowl year after my dad had bought farm machinery and got away from the horse farming. Mm -hmm. So we had some tough years financially, mm -hmm. but we never went hungry. Mm -hmm. We survived those dust storm years. Mm -hmm. I went through three different ones where it's the black, you couldn't see your hand in front of you. Mm -hmm. So those were pretty tough years. What, what kind of, uh, did you, how many acres was your farm or your ranch? There's four sections counting the pasture and land for cattle and mm -hmm. dad bought mm -hmm. another quarter section mm -hmm. at 3% interest and we never could pay the interest on it. So we finally lost that. Mm -hmm. So he said to his, all of his children, don't ever go in debt. Wow. What is there a story too particular you can remember about the Dust Bowl? You know, you hear a lot of stories about dust up above the windows and and covering the crops and what certainly this must have made a pretty strong impression on you, Bill. I mean, were some certain events that you remember particularly about the Dust Bowl? Oh, of course there was fences covered over with mm. tumbleweeds and sand and mm. cattle could walk right up over them. But you talked about one event. There was a funeral of a little, I think three or four year old girl in Boy City. And my parents and I and a neighbor, both uh, an uncle of mine rather, mm -hmm went to that funeral. Mm -hmm. And as we left the funeral, one of those great big clouds of dust came in as the procession was going to the cemetery in our local community. And the people thought it was the end of the world. But we drove into a place that was called a roadhouse. That wasn't a very good place in those times. Mm -hmm. And we stayed there for about three hours before it got light enough that we could see the drive. Wow. And my uncle, I was old enough to drive. My uncle told us where the end of the road was so we didn't get off in it. Mm -hmm. We finally got home after that. Uh -huh. But that was just black as night for about two hours mm -hmm. in the middle of the afternoon. Wow. Bill, what, what year did you graduate from high school? 1938. 38. Did, did, you, then, did you go to Oklahoma State right after No, I school? went to Panhandle and m College for two years. Okay. And then went into service, and mm -hmm. I was uh, later then afterward on the GI Bill. Went to school here at OSU and graduated. Mm -hmm. It was Oklahoma A and M then mm -hmm. in 1947, mm -hmm. 
I went immediately to work then in Stevens County as a 4-H agent down there, assistant county agent. Bill, go back, could you, could you share a little bit about your experience in World War II, what theater you were in? And I was in the Army Air Force, mm -hmm. and that's about all I care to say about it. Okay, all right. Uh, were, were you in Europe or in, in, yeah. in Europe? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Bill, so you then got out, of the, got out of the Army and right after the war in 45? 1945, October 31. Okay. And then I worked for a year and then came back over, I guess when I came to Oklahoma State, in the fall of 1946, and then I won a full year and graduated, mm -hmm. summer and all. Right, and you used the GI Bill yeah. to help, as you said. And turned back a lot of it that I never, already had a master's degree, degree program laid out with, uh, for the whole thing, and then the district director for the extension service said, you'll never need a master's degree working for the cooperative extension service. <laughs> So I went to work, and later I wished I'd have got that master's degree, but it would have been a research degree then, and I wanted to work with people. Well, Bill, kind of jumping back, but what uh, what influenced you to enroll at Oklahoma State University? Did you did you have a background? Had you come up 4-H or FFA to the university before? I was in 4-H mm -hmm. most of my early years in life, but uh, oh, it was, I think, mainly a, I wanted to be in the extension service, and I think I felt like that that degree would carry more weight than one from Panhandle a and College out there. Bill, why did you why did you want to be an extension director? Did, did you know that when you went, when you first went to college that's what you wanted to be? Probably, I think so. I thought first about trying to be a veterinarian, but we had a county agent named Uncle Bill Baker, mm -hmm. and we just all thought he was the greatest fellow in the world. And he sat me down and talked to me one time about that it was a good thing to be involved in mm -hmm. and I think that kind of started me along that route and mm -hmm. I thought I'd better do that. That's what I wanted to do. Is it kind of a role model to you? Because you it was working with people. Mm -hmm. Okay. What? Uh, so you enrolled in 47. Who, who was the dean of the college at that time? Uh, Al Darlow. Al Darlow. Mm -hmm. Dr. Darlow. For one of the famous deans really. Yes yeah, sir. Mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you remember about Dean uh, Darlow? Well, I remember him teaching some courtesy courses still back in animal science where an undergraduate degree is. And mm -hmm. he uh, he also remained judging livestock a time or two, and I remember that. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's probably all I remember. I remember more about him after he retired than before. You talk about the livestock judging. Were you on the livestock judging team when you were no, a student? No, I was not. I didn't have time, I thought, after the war and tried to get on through because I was married then and, mm -hmm. and our oldest daughter had been born and thought I better get to work. Get, get as many hours in as you could and get out there. Right? Yeah. What, what about your undergraduate experience, Bill? Can you talk a little bit about where most of your classes were? What, what buildings were your classes in? Gee, I hadn't thought of that in years. <laughs> no, I really hadn't thought of it in years. There was the old animal husbandry building and that's right. quite a few of them. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I think, no less later on, if there's a chemistry building. I, uh, well, I recall that uh, I thought I had to get on out in a year and a, in the summer I took, well, I took uh, 18 hours both semesters and 10 hours in summer in order to be able to graduate in a year. Okay, so you got out within three so semesters. So I didn't really have time to, to, to do it that much. Yeah. I lived in Veterans Village. And that was an experience. Your bed village? Yeah. Mm -hmm. you get, we went home for Christmas one time and it turned extremely cold and froze everything in that building, including the bathroom stool and <laughs> everything that had water in it. And so it took quite a while for all that to be repaired so we could get back and live in it. Mm -hmm. yeah. but we were glad to go on and get to work. <laughs> and I worked with a great fellow mm -hmm. named Fred Huffine. Mm -hmm. He was a main county agent down at Stevens County at Duncan, and I learned a lot from working with him. I learned Bill. a lot about people and how to approach. And I always say, if you don't know the answer to something, just admit it and say, I'll find out for you. Mm -hmm. and in fact, that's something that all of us should do, whatever we're doing. Right. Well, 
kind of just ask one more time about OSU. Were there some professors you had that, that were influential to you that, that uh, in that year that you were at OSU that you remember that it made an impression on you? Yes, one was named Glenn Bratcher. He was the head of the animal science department. Mm -hmm. And then Dr. Jim Watley, he taught animal breeding. Mm -hmm. And he was a great teacher. Oh. And Joe Whiteman was another one that taught, mm -hmm. actually he taught uh, statistics, but I didn't take that, it was in a master's degree program. Who, who was your advisor, Bill, when you were there? He was later president of the college at uh, South Dakota, Gee, I have a blank space, I can't remember his name. He was my undergraduate mm -hmm. advisor. Beeson? He was a great, huh? Beeson? No, Harlan. Oh. Harlan. No, no. Well, anyway, maybe yeah, I'll think of okay. yeah. through it. Sure, no, no problem. So, so your first assignment then, Bill, as you said earlier, you were at Stevens County as assistant yes, uh, county agent? Yes. Under, uh, you mentioned the individual? Fred you, Huffine. Fred Huffine. And so did you know? Is there some? Did you have some surprises, Bill, when you got there that you didn't think about being a you know in the county extension work? Fred was a great teacher. Mm -hmm. I remember one time we, uh, uh, the county agents back at that time were called upon to do minor uh, veterinary work for people mm -hmm. and to go out and you know help castrate calves or whatever that needed to be done, but. The phone rang one morning, we were both in the office, and he answered the phone and he, he turned to me and he said, have you ever dehorned a, a, a cow? And I said, oh yes, I grew up doing that. Come on, we're going to go out and do it. So he had a saw and everything to use. <laughs> and we got out there and he grabbed us, we put the rope around the animal to make it lay down, you know, like you're supposed to do. And he grabbed the saw and cut it off. And on the way back in, he said, that's the first one I ever dehorned said, did I do it all right? <laughs> he asked me how to do it all, and going out there. So he said, there are sometimes you need to, to do things. Mm -hmm. You need to learn how. You do, absolutely. But what, uh, so, you kind of share after Stevens County, can you kind of share your, your career where you, your career track, some of the places you were at? Yes, I went then to Tologa in Dewey County, which mm -hmm. is south of Woodward between there and Clinton and was there three years and it's a strange place to work because the little old town of Tologa in the middle but there were four towns Visai and Elidi and and uh, Sealing and then even down in the south part of the county over at Fay all of those communities were separate within themselves and had different type of people in agriculture mainly the, the kind of crops that they grew and all that. Mm -hmm. But that's quite an experience working in that setting. Mm -hmm. And I just thought if I ever made over $1,000 a month, I'd do awful well. Which well, brings up a question. When you, when you were assistant uh, county agent there in Stevens County, what was your salary? Your first year? I started out at 2700 a year. 2700 a year? Yeah. Not a month? No, no. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, well, no. Bill, what what are the major responsibilities of a, of a county agent? Uh, what 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 were you expected to do as, as county agent or, or county extension director? I guess they call it now. You were an advisor regarding all. I think primarily uh, the pest control in in uh, both crops and animals, mm -hmm. and then uh, in the larger towns there was also a lot of calls for from city people for trees and plants and gardening and. And of course, the 4-H club work right. that spanned a lot of different activities and, and involved working with volunteer leaders and people. And again, the whole success was working with people, mm -hmm. serving people, mm -hmm. so you really, working for the taxpayer, for people. So you really got to know the people of the county really well, as aging most of the families, yes, particularly farm families. One of the great things about, I think, and I've talked to other people that's been in extension service, once you had been there for several months or years or so or longer, and you'd really served and helped people, you were kind of an adopted member of their family. And it was a great privilege and to be and an honor to be included in so many different families. 
And if you were there at lunchtime, you would offend them if you didn't eat lunch with them. That's great. So, so what do you were you in charge of helping recruit volunteer workers for you know say for 4-H with oh students? Oh yes, and, we had the training all the time for that, mm -hmm. and I think that the really the secret of of course you try to get parents or relatives of those that were in the club sure. work at that time, mm -hmm. but the success of the program depended largely on how well those volunteers worked, mm -hmm. because one person cannot be at all those clubs at one time or in any farm or bunches of farms at one time. Where well, there's some strong families traditionally. That, the kids that's that that's true. Year in, year out. And particularly in showing of animals mm -hmm. and uh, uh, showing crops at fairs and things of that mm -hmm. sort. Bill, did you work, I guess, pretty closely, of course, with the county fair each year? Oh, my, yeah, that, you're the secretary of the fair in a lot of mm -hmm. those places. Mm -hmm. And I worked pretty close, in my case, with ag teachers, and I've had some awfully good ones that I shared work with. And we both kind of agreed that there wasn't any point in trying to fuss over who had which children as members, mm -hmm. but there were so many of them that weren't members of either one of the clubs yeah. that we were after. Yeah. So in, in general, I think back at that time, most of them stayed in 4-H until they were eligible and old enough to be in high school for the FFA program. Mm -hmm. And they could work as a local community much more intensively than I could across the county. Mm -hmm. It was better for the kids. And then I guess too the, the, the county office, the, you know, the extension office was sort of a, a uh, OSU office as well. I mean, you, oh yes, you had it's the Extension mm -hmm. Service Oklahoma State University. Mm -hmm. We had the backup of a lot of specialists here in very subject matter fields uh, who supported us mm -hmm. as background information. We could call them on the phone mm -hmm. and get help when we needed it, particularly in the insect world and that sort of thing. And, We'd hold uh, meetings and training sessions for uh, producers and for people of all kind. We had one person in Woodburn, I remember that uh, he was a specialist at the in roses, and I learned more from him, or if I had something I could not answer, varieties or something, I could refer him to him and he'd help out. And he'd come to short courses that we'd hold and talk about it. And you and I was you used all those kind of people you could mm -hmm. locally. Mm -hmm. Tom Thedford, I was visiting with him recently, and, he, and your name come up and said he worked with you. And of course, he was out of veterinary medicine, yeah, extension did. work, and, and yeah. worked with you. So you had all these different, from the different fields and specialists and different areas that work with you. Oh my, and yes. Mm -hmm. Great backup program. Mm -hmm. That's great. Well, Bill, you know, you were trained, and then you, you know, had a year as assistant, but but what, what surprise? What was different when you actually got out there doing the work? You know, than what you thought it'd be like. Were there some surprises for you? Some aha experiences, things you didn't expect? Well, I'm sure there were a lot of them, but you try to get erase those things out of your mind. <laughs> <laughs> Forgotten them now. <laughs> I don't recall any particular one that, uh, because we always had that backup program, and our district director at the time I worked was Mr. J. M. Curley Ives. And he impressed on us very much, if you don't know the answer, don't be afraid to say no, but I will find out for you. And I had a lot of that, those circumstances, because you couldn't know all there was to know about everything. No he, way. His name is, he spelled Curly his name. Ives, I-V-E-S. Okay, H-I-V-E-S, Ives? I-V-E-S. I -V -E -S. I -V -E -S. Oh, God, okay, Ives. He was a top-notch person. Mm -hmm. He was our district director. Okay in northwest Oklahoma. So you had different district directors yes. around the, the, the county agency where you didn't report directly to the state There's office? four districts in the state. Okay, then. got it. What, uh, uh, can you share some highlights, Bill, of your professional career? You, you said you went from Stevens County as assistant agent to, to Dewey County, then did you go to Woodward County from there? Yes, mm -hmm. I was in Dewey County three years, then in Woodward it was almost seven years, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, I don't know, the president, the one he's talking about highlights, President Dwight Eisenhower made a drought tour mm -hmm. of all across the United States, and one of the stops was Woodward County. Mm -hmm. And to be involved in all of the preparation, working with Secret Service people, and the preparation of everybody, uh, the, Repub the Republican Party at that time, President Eisenhower's Republican, was uh, a lawyer, Reuben Sparks from Woodward. So he and I worked very closely together and we had to 
be sure every person on that route was checked out on the Secret Service and all of this. And it was a great experience. But I'll remember the morning that President Eisenhower arrived in the old Columbine. That was Air Force One then. And it was cold January morning, January 10th, I think it was, I remember. And <clears throat> there was probably 3,000 people lined up outside the fence wow. in that yeah. cold morning, wrapped in blankets mm -hmm. and all the clothing they'd get. They'd stood there for quite a while. Mm -hmm. And as soon as we got in the limo and the Secret Service man was sitting, I was in the middle, he was on my right, the driver. And <clears throat> President Eisenhower said, how long have these people been here? And I told him. and. He said, let's go greet him. And that Secret Service man, I could just hear him just feel like he was crunching up like, it, oh, no, let's don't do this. And President Eisenhower was in the back seat on the side that he had drove around. He ro rolled the window down and waved at that crowd all the way around that. When he got through, he said, this is an inspiration for me. And he said, when I reviewed the troops, troops in Europe, he said, is same feeling, how great it is to have great people. It's a great story. So I always thought a lot of him. And did you have barbecue for lunch? <laughs> they had private lunch for him. He went on somewhere else. I thought, maybe, thought it was going to be. <laughs> yeah, I thought maybe we brought our, bar, our, what was our barbecue specialist's name. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what was his name? Yeah, but usually when we had a special yeah. event, we always had, yeah. had the barbecue. No, he was there early in the morning. And the farm family, by the way, that were interviewed on his visit there, they went out in the wheat field and all that, but they insisted that he go inside their home and visit with the farmer's wife and the children. Mm -hmm. So all that had to be secret ahead of time. Mm -hmm. They couldn't even tell their kids until that morning. Mm -hmm. They could stay out of school. Mm -hmm. But one of the funny things that happened was that the cousin of this fellow that farm they visited, he <clears throat> went over uh, before the president came, and there was Carl Peoples out on top of the barn nailing down some tin that had been loose for years. And he went home, <laughs> Estelle went home and told his wife, he said, I saw a crazy person today, and he said his name was Carl. <laughs> on a cold morning <laughs> to do that. <laughs> But uh, these people, had, they were so glad that the President of the United States had come into their home. Mm -hmm. Just common people. Well, did, did after the Woodward job, did, did you then go into administrative position? Uh, no, I was called. And, uh, my children's mother died out there with cancer. And about, a, oh, I don't know, a year after that, Luther Brandon was this extension director, and he called me and ask if I would come in and be a state livestock specialist. That's the time when you became an instant one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but he said, now you'll have to get an advanced degree in that field. I'd already finished the master's by hit and miss, you know, and correspondence, a lot of that. Some summer courses. courses. Mm -hmm. But anyway, he said, uh, I can't pay any more money, but when you get it done, hopefully the budget will be better. So, and he said, we want you to take off full year and go to school. And so I came in and I served seven years in that field. So, so what year did you take off, Bill? Do you remember? 1958. So you finished your PhD in one year? No, I did a, I finished that master's degree at that right. next summer. And then oh. the, the, got the, the doctor's degree in 1964. Okay. So I took it over a summer period summer of time. time. Okay. Yeah. So you were seven years in as, as livestock specialist yeah. extension, and so you go out the whole and, state. Yeah. So you'd work, travel through the state. Went to a lot of state and county fairs. And <laughs> like goat roping. I saw a lot, <laughs> a lot of pigs and all that. You know. Have <laughs> uh, you got some favorite stories from your time as livestock? Yeah, and surely there's some good stories there. Well, you know, as a state's educator mm. or specialist, you never knew quite how to approach a audience mm -hmm. in their background training and understanding. Mm -hmm. And I recall being, we were a separate from uh, the black folks at that time, mm -hmm. of the 1890 people were called. Mm -hmm. And I was called to go over to Port to uh, Eastern Oklahoma with Harold Berry as a county agent there, and he was a good one. 
and visit with Mr. Luther Scales. He had a problem in his ventilation barn, his hogs. Well, I had no idea. Now he said, O'Hara said, you come early because we're going out there early. So I was out there on time and Mr. Scales had a modern hog barn and I didn't know that he had bought hogs from Jim Watley who did swine research here. And oh, he had a great herd of swine. And the problem was so simple in that barn that even I could understand it. And he said, come on down here in the well house and I've got some protein supplements for my cows. And I want you to tell me which is the best. Well, I got down there and he had cotton seed cake and soybean cake and a protein block. Well, I misunderstood how much he might know. I should have known with his progressive hog farm, but I, I made a mistake and didn't know, realize it. So I went through all of those step by step, very simply, and explained the new need for one cow and the cost. And I got that protein block, and this is twice, two and a half times as expensive as some of the others. And he kind of grinned at me and he said, yes, sir, I understand, but be all right with you if I use that protein block on quail days? <laughs> <laughs> so he suckered me. <laughs> you got some more good ones, we'll... I'm one other was real funny, I'll okay. tell one other. When I was at Woodford, I took some 4-H club boys down to Oklahoma City to livestock judging mm -hmm. one spring. We didn't have any animals down there that year. And we were in the judging contest, and I explained to these boys the night before, two in one room, two in another, and me and the third one in the old Huckins Hotel. And we're gonna get up early and get out there. So that morning came and I called one room and they answered quickly, and yep, we're getting ready. Called the other room, no answer. And they kept, answer, kept calling, so I dressed quickly and went up there, and Jerry Wells came to the door, I'll never forget it. I said, Jerry, didn't you hear that phone rang? Yes, sir, but it wasn't our phone number. <laughs> That's one of those two longs and the shorts, you know, and all that. <laughs> party, party lines. Party lines, yeah. <laughs> I could tell those kind of things all day long. <laughs> well, Bill, we're so after your uh, seven years as a livestock specialist. Jim Watley had me come into his, he was dean of agriculture then, and, and be a program leader for agriculture. Mm -hmm. And I served in that capacity for, oh, let's see, about five years, I guess. And then I became, Frank Baker became dean, mm -hmm. and I was the associate director then mm -hmm. through the process of application and employment. And I served as associate director for about almost seven years. Who, who was the director at that time, Bill? Who was your director that you reported to? Uh, Charlie Browning, primarily. Okay. Yeah, Frank Baker first, Frank, yeah, four years, Brian. and Charlie later. Okay. Well, maybe kind of back up the question I wanted to ask you. Could you kind of share a little bit of your your thoughts and your memories about some of those those deans? We talked about Dean Darlow. Could we kind of go through Darlow and maybe through the deans you worked with and tell me a little bit about each one and what you what you remember about them? We're starting with Darlow, what do you remember about Al Darlow? Yes, I remember working over in Whitehurst for a year or two when he was the dean over there. And then I worked with Jim Watley. There's a, also a, a Burr Ross was dean for quite a long time, and he was he was one of the instructors when I got the undergraduate degree. Dr. Briggs, Hilton Briggs, was my undergraduate advisor. Okay. And I worked some with him, of course, as a student mm -hmm. and a teacher. And then after Jim Watley was Frank Baker, and then Charles Browning. Mm -hmm. And I retired then while Charlie was still dean here. I've heard a lot of stories about Al Darlow. What, what do you remember about about Dean Darlow? He was a very good teacher. I had one course under him a long time ago, and I remember him mainly, though I think, as uh, being one that uh, worked with the animal people and. I don't remember any specific interest, instance except when I was over in Whitehurst Hall. I recall a time or two that visit with him and he'd give advice. And then there was a, an exper experiment station director that I worked with over in Ag Hall that I learned quite a bit, Lewis Hawkins. Lewis was a hard taskmaster, but he kind of took me under wing 
and taught me a lot of things about administration. I said, you've got to be tough. I said, sometimes tougher than you want to be. <laughs> but we had lost a daughter to a drunk driver out in Arizona then, and they had lost a, a daughter also in a car wreck. And I think maybe he wanted to take me under his wing kind of as a second son. He never had a son. So I learned a lot from, from Dr. Hawkins. But he was pretty tough on a lot of research people if they hadn't done their homework right. Now you mentioned earlier Luther Brandon was, was when you first got an extension work, was had an extension. What do, you, what do you remember about uh, Dr. Brandon? Well, I remember a lot about him being a, a real, he, Shawnee Brown was the first director we had. Okay. And he, uh, Oh, he was a he was a very fine director, and so was Al Darlow, or so was uh, Luther Brannan. Luther, as I recall, he well, he he brought me in, you know, and I've always appreciated that. And why he did that, I'm not real sure, but I guess he thought he wasn't making a mistake, and I was didn't want to disappoint him. But anyway, he went into the Ethiopian project and worked over there for a long time, and that's. Uh, I guess I knew him that way too, but I don't remember any particular instance about it particularly. Mm -hmm. Then to see your deans, then after Darlo was uh, was uh, Baker, then was that the next dean, or is there one in there in between I'm missing? Was it Jim Watley. Oh, Jim Watley, right. Yeah, I was dean, and he had been, uh, of course, an instructor over in animal mm -hmm. science, and I'd known him, and he had selected me to be in a special position it's called the Ag Leadership Program for the Ag Director for the Extension Service. Could you, and, could you say a little more about that, Bill, what, about the program, the Ag Leadership Program? Well, you were supposed to kind of be working with all of the departments in the, in the College of Agriculture in terms for programs that might fit mm -hmm. in short courses and, and agricultural work out in the counties. I did a lot of uh, working with the department heads on on insect control programs and special livestock training and that sort of thing. And it, it was a very interesting, challenging kind of thing because it's a new position. There wasn't any blueprints to go by. Bill, was that the, the beginning of the program that continues up today, the Ag Leadership no, Program? No, it had nothing to do with that. It's different, different uh, that program. It was different entirely. Okay. I did serve in that one after I retired. Mm -hmm. Okay. What uh, some of the, uh, is there some farm families that you worked with in your times as a county extension director that stand out in your mind? Are there some individuals or families you recall had some special times with? Uh, yes, uh, quite a few of them, more than we'd have time to talk about really. But uh, a lot of them were people that worked as 4 H leaders. Mm -hmm. There was there's quite a few of those that uh, stand out in my mind because they were there helping and you worked with them intensively. Mm -hmm. and then there was some that uh, all they, particularly on the cattle side, that had uh, most of the county agents back at that time also served as secretary of the Hereford Breeders Association or whatever livestock groups they had, if it was overall breeds or what. Mm -hmm. And I worked quite a bit with some of those kind both as county director and later then, but mainly as county director, county agent then. What, uh, just sort of a general question, Bill, for you to think about on your lengthy career, how, how has the College of Education changed from, you know, when you, as a student through your career to today in the college itself? Is there any changes that that, uh, that you Are think you of. about agriculture education? I'm thinking about the College of Agriculture now because I want to I ask you about agriculture okay. in Oklahoma okay. next, but just in the college. How has the college changed over the years? Oh, I don't know that I know exactly how to answer that. I'm not an expert, but I think with the access or the introduction of computers would be one of the main things that changed the whole, the whole picture a lot. And it's certainly important today in the account extension work. Mm -hmm. You can get the information over the computer and the printout in a hurry mm -hmm. by simply knowing the access code and all that. But we had uh, 
literacy training courses when Dean Watley was there for our department heads in computer literacy. And I think the hardest thing was to get even some of our full professor department heads to come take that course because <laughs> they didn't want to be looked at as though they were dumb. Mm -hmm. well, they were kind of a dread of something that new and complex, particularly if you didn't have much background in math. So that's one of the things that certainly has changed. And then I think when Gene Evans was director here and the introduction to the fact sheet program, where you had the answer to a specific question in one or two sheets of paper, called the Lord the Premium or the Printing Cost, and made them available in every county. Then another thing that I think was extremely important, Raymond Case was head of the Hort Department and he and, and I went down and met with the people at OETA and he started out as the first director of the gardening program, Oklahoma Gardening. Mm -hmm. And he did a tremendous job. Now, I'll never forget one of the fellows after that had been going a couple of years that uh, 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 fell out in the counties that listened to that all the time. And he came to me at some meeting, I forgot, and he said, what a great program. It's sure a good thing you all did that. He said, do you know, God doesn't charge the time against you that you spend in the garden. <laughs> of course, I'd never heard that before. Oh, that's a great story. Or sayings. Yeah. Well, uh, Bill, when we were talking about the college and you sort of asked the question, let me come back to it. How has agriculture in Oklahoma changed since you, you know, started in business years ago? Well, from so, uh, small farms to much, much larger farms, much more complex, mm -hmm. and uh, difficult, I think, with trying to compete with the, the market and the weather. Of course, that is constant through the years, but ups and downs. Mm -hmm. And then, oh, if you're talking about it today, that farmer's got to be an expert almost in computer science, in the farm markets for futures. He's got to have his eggs in several baskets, so to speak, because you never know what prices are going to be. And there's a lot of experts that are out there as consultants helping the great big farmers. But I think the biggest change probably is from small to larger, much larger farms. Very complex. Particularly in the Panhandle, where you grew up, that really has changed. Well, everywhere, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, mainly there, but there's here in this county, it's not a big agricultural production of crops and all that. Always had a lot of cattle. Mm -hmm. But uh, all up in the Osage, or on the uh, country around Enid and Alva and Woodward and up in there, mm -hmm. all western Oklahoma. It's larger. Quite a difference in the western side of the state and the eastern side of the state mm -hmm. in agriculture. How has, how has it changed in terms of crops versus cattle and, and hogs, and what has been the changes? Well, there was lots of small hog operations then. There's no longer exist with the big hog farms. Right. I don't know the cattle numbers. Uh, for quite a long time, I think we were about the second or the third largest cow, cat, cow population of any state in the country. Maybe Texas and Kansas were ahead of us, I've forgotten. but. Uh, there's always been cattle, I think, on the farms. There's always been grassland that was too rough to farm and had to be utilized with the cattle, harvested the cattle. Bill, looking back on, on your career, uh, were there some highlights in your career, or some milestones that, that you particularly remember? Yes, I started out in the PhD program in animal science and went into that a full year and had 60 some hours. Had a lot of the ag uh, biochem courses and statistics, math, stat, and all that. And I really didn't want a research degree. And I, I went to Dr. Hillier, who was my advisor at that time, and great disappointment to him. But I said, I've got to change where I can work with people more. So I went over and uh, into the College of Education and took courses that were working with people primarily. Mm -hmm. But I did that move on purpose. And it was a disappointment to most of my colleagues in animal science, but 
that's where I just felt like I was led in what I ought to do, and I did it. Was your was your doctorate in the College of Education? Then? Yes. Okay. Yes. So you got the uh, EDD. Yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. I've okay. got it down there. Okay. Wonderful. Who who were some of the people you remember taking classes under over there? Dr. Richard Youngers, who taught uh, school finance, and I didn't particularly want to take that course, but it's required. <laughs> And then, uh, oh, let's see. My major advisor there was, uh, I'm having trouble remembering some names this morning, mm -hmm. but uh, he was a great person and I, I enjoyed working under him. And mm -hmm. We became great friends after he retired and I did too. And well, in addition to following your career as assistant, uh, you know, county extension director, then director, and then you were associate at, uh, over all of it. You're a specialist, a livestock specialist, in for seven years, and then you were associate uh, uh, dean in charge of all extension for the for the state. Then yes, sir. Uh, what what years was that, Bill? From about uh, let's see, Frank Baker came in nineteen. Uh, I finished in nineteen eighty four. He came in nineteen. Late seventies, I believe, because I was almost seven years there. But I guess one of the highlights, and after, in addition to being all the functional director of sorts in the state, because Jim Watley said, "I don't know anything about extension. You run it." And Charlie Browning essentially said the same thing, but Charlie wanted to be kept informed and a lot more detail than Jim Watley did, but. I had the privilege of working at the national level with what was called the Extension Committee on Organization and Policy, which essentially was the, the organization for all the extension directors in the country. And serving on that committee and working with the people in Washington in legislation and, and a lot of the big organizations and that sort of thing was a great learning experience. But it was a great learning experience because I suppose like an army general or something, you had to have a lot of good help or it couldn't be done. And we fought for funds all the time at the federal level and I had some real good people that served in different capacities. That was a real pleasure. Were you in D.C. and you know, did you visit with, with congressmen? And, and Oh yeah, I did some of that, yes. But primarily in the Department of Agriculture. Who, who do you remember? Some of the people you worked with at the time that uh, there were close friends of yours uh, that you worked with. Well, yes, there was a, a extension director in Michigan named Gordon Geyer that mm -hmm. worked with very closely. He followed me in that position, and then uh, when Ronald Reagan was elected president, mm -hmm. I had a, there was a fellow that was in the interim program they called it from one administration to the other that came from California, and he's a big ag guy. Mm -hmm. And I need, needed to meet him because that's when I was the national president. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got to through the door to see him and lay out what we hoped we could do that year. Mm -hmm. And when he's, I sat down in front of him, he said, do you know there's a Bill Taggart up here as a lobbyist? And I said, no. <laughs> And he said, I'll tell you, the only reason you got through my door, I want to see what you look like. But said, he'd make two or three of you. He said, he weighs about 350. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only reason I got to talk to him. But when we had a later meeting, he agreed to come and talk to us. Because right. he was kind of the interim guy mm -hmm. for the Reagan administration. Part of the transition team. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Well, so to speak, you mentioned him being president of the National you know, association with some other special recognition or awards that you received, and I know you're a modest individual, but could you share some of the recognition awards well, that you received? I worked with the Livestock Conservation, which was a great plains group for quite a few years, and did that mainly when I was an extension specialist. Oh, I worked then a lot with the National 4-H people and FFA people, and that was a good pleasure too, but that's probably enough of that. Well, you received a Distinguished uh, uh, Service Award, I think, did you not, through Extension, as I recall? Well, it's through the Department of Agriculture, and, mm -hmm. and I didn't put it on there, but I'm uh, 
Alpha Zeta alone, and that was a honorary deal in agriculture and and uh, oh, I don't know. I got some of them listed in that yeah. brochure. Well, can you tell me a little bit about the Distinguished Service Award from the that was in the department, uh, uh, the uh, the uh, U.S. That, Ag Department? That material that I gave you is a yeah. copy of that book, but mm -hmm. it mainly is biographical information and where you served and worked and. Mm -hmm some of the highlights of one my career. Well, what were some of the, some of the uh, guidelines for receiving that award? Uh, the years of service and contributions you'd made to Extension, is it? I suppose so. I never was told. <laughs> <laughs> You've been off modest, Bill. I'm I trying to pull so. that out of you. That's good. I hope so. Mm -hmm. But what about uh, hobbies and special interests do you have? I know you've been retired a few years now and have had a chance to do some of that. Could you I know you love hunting and some things, but can you share some of your interests and hobbies? I do woodwork. Mm -hmm. I'll give you the, I'll give you the, <laughs> I can give you the high four and a half. <laughs> that mainly was my hobby, but mm -hmm. uh, the hunting uh, mm -hmm. after I retired mainly was with some a little bit before, but mm -hmm. I've turned down a lot of uh, invitations from ranchers to hunt quail when I was working in the counties and. Mm -hmm. I didn't think I had time to do that. Mm -hmm. I regret now that I didn't do more of that. But Did you look some of them up after you retired? <laughs> <laughs> well, we went out to far western Oklahoma and hunted coyotes some, mm -hmm. but it's mainly to hunt pheasants. But my nephews out there always wanted to hunt coyotes instead. We got tired of going out there for that. Well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, your your religious faith has always been important to you. I know. Very much so. And uh, you've been a long time leader in, in the First United Methodist Church here in Stillwater. Uh, in what ways has your, your personal faith influenced your life? Oh, in lots of ways. I grew up in a strong Christian family. Mm -hmm. I think that's the right foundation for any family. I'm fortunate indeed to have that kind of background. But then I think mainly the tragedies that's happened in my life. Mm -hmm. If you I don't know what you'd do if you didn't have a strong faith on which to turn. And then in the tough times <coughs> in your jobs and in your work, it's impossible to, you always had to feel like you had direction and guidance. Mm -hmm. But like I've heard lots of other people say, I believe very strongly in prayer. Well, Bill, what, uh, some reflecting back as we kind of conclude here, there's a lot of individuals that you've had a chance to work with and to know, and you, you've mentioned some of these in an interview that are no longer with us today. Uh, could you, kind of, sort of going back and, and thinking when you as a student in your early career, uh, some people that influenced you and, and what you remember about them that you could share with us that just had an impact in your life? Yes, sir. Uh, quite a few of them in church. There was one named Hogg Thompson that was in animal science, and I never had any coursework under him, but, and I've already mentioned Lewis Hawkins, mm -hmm. and then uh, all there have been people uh, at the county level that mm -hmm. I had strong support from, and then I've mentioned uh, Fred Huffine, who worked, mm -hmm. he, I learned a lot from Fred just by following and listening, and gee, there's lots of others that I mm -hmm. probably don't recall at the there's one professor when I was struggling with advanced analytical chemistry and as a working toward a PhD and I took that course as a seven hour course in the summertime. The first time I came back as a full time student and I broke more glass probably than any other student in the class and he got me off to the side. He was in our Methodist church too, and I've long since forgotten his name, but I have to look it up on my transcript. Mm -hmm. And he said, you're having trouble in this course, but he said, I see you trying. He said, would you want to come to my house and let me tutor you? Mm -hmm. What a blessing that was, but mm -hmm. I don't know, I'm kind of a stubborn rascal, but I decided I wasn't going to enter, I wasn't going to disappoint him. Mm -hmm. I never worked so hard in my life made an A in that course. Yeah. Great. Great story. Yeah. You had a lot of folks in I wouldn't like have that. done it if you hadn't had that confidence in me. I'm positive of that. Yeah. 
But some of the courses I had that don't make a too good degree in mm. are some of the most <laughs> important <laughs> yeah. good grade in that I made the most <laughs> progress in probably. I had difficulty with math stat because mm -hmm. I didn't have the math, right math background. Mm -hmm. And uh, J Joe Whiteman was pretty, I didn't even understand that when uh, Bob Morrison taught it. Mm -hmm. That brings up another thing I'll tell you in a little bit. But anyway, uh, that that course when Jim, or when uh, uh, in animal science, it was called research in animal science or something of that sort, Joe Whiteman taught it. Mm -hmm. It all began to kind of open up and I could see the sense in all of these different principles and all that. And it made a whole lot of sense then. And I really enjoyed that later then, but I didn't have the right background for it. Later, whenever I was doing my research for the dissertation, I was at the livestock show in Oklahoma City and I was down there in a room by myself and I took all my work that I was writing part of that dissertation with, with me and it, <clears throat> I left it in the car one evening and was too tired to work and someone broke into it and took the briefcase. It took me about a year to put all that or all that stuff back together. Wow! But that was one disappointment, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. But it was all on computer cards, mm -hmm. all the research. So we just had to haul the cards back; they hadn't been destroyed yet. <laughs> that was, that was good. Well, that was wow. Well, Bill, let me turn the coin a little. You talk about people influencing you in your life; they were mentors to you and were special. Can you think of some some people that worked under you that? Uh, that you take a special pride in, that uh, you recall there's some people you'd like to share that you influenced their lives and maybe mentored them? One of them is named Aubrey Wilson. Ah. And of course Fred Huffine that I've already mentioned. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, well I can remember some individuals in the county, but uh, Pat Patrick at Clinton mm -hmm. was another one that I thought a lot of. And, Vernon Stevens that worked later as an area agent for us. Well, I could just name hundreds of those, but if you don't learn something with everybody with whom you associate, you haven't been listening. And you you can learn if you just don't talk too much. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we got two ears and one mouth, right? You should listen twice as much as you speak. Uh, no, that's, that's true. I mean, you learn more. But that's why you've got two ears and one mouth, isn't it? I read somewhere. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. Well, t two kind of final questions, Bill. One, just reflecting, kind of looking back on your life, from a, you know, a young man out in the panhandle in the middle of the Depression, did you ever imagine where your life would, would take you? I mean, looking back, saying, how did, I, how did I get here? I mean, it's been an amazing career. I mean, and, and I'm saying this for you because I know you're a humble guy. We've said it, and you come from a you know, a farm in the, in the middle of, I'll say middle of nowhere, out in the Oklahoma Panhandle and Depression. You come through, and you, you go through and survive World War II, you come through the ranks of, and you go up to Associate Dean for extension for the whole state of, of the Oklahoma. Did you ever imagine in your wildest dreams that your life would lead you there? Well, the first thing I heard you say on this question was, in the uh, next to the final question, wasn't it? Yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I think uh, I would have never thought that I would have done the kind of things that I had the opportunity to do. But uh, you, you just, opportunities open up and there you have to do the best you can with whatever you have and whatever opportunities you're given and I tried to make the most of those. But I think it, despite a career, but if I've Oh, to say it another way, maybe a cliche kind of thing, and not, not really that, it's pretty important to me. The most important accomplishment I've made is my family. Can you tell us a little bit about your family? Okay. Well, they're all good Christian people, yeah. and they've always been, and when their mother died, I think, well, it just looked like it was because Gary, the youngest one, was he was just about three and a half years old. And my oldest daughter, Karen, who was killed, was 11 or 12. But I think out of some of those kind of things come 
growth and blessings that maybe wouldn't have otherwise happened. There had to be a lot of responsibilities that uh, they had to share and learning to manage their school lunch funds and things that way, their allowances and, and being more independent, maybe independent upon each other within the family. And they're still that way. And I've got a lot of good grandkids too and some great grandkids. Got one grandson that's gonna hope to be a youth minister. They're all active in their churches. So I'm proud of them. Well, are there other special memories you have of your career in your life and the special times in your life that are important to you, professionally or personally? I don't recall any particular right now that hobby you mentioned. I've pursued that pretty strongly because it was a relief from the tensions that you dealt with what you dealt. But I've never sold anything that I've ever made. I give it away. And I don't want that to sound like boasting. It's not, that's not me. But somehow, I just felt like that that's what I was supposed to do with it. So I spent quite a bit of money and quite a bit of time over 40 years of doing those sort of things and being glad of it. This pumpkin patch is coming up shortly here at the church. And I made things for that for several years. I've never sold anything and don't intend to, but I've got a list of hundreds of articles I've given away. And the only reason I keep a list is, is so I don't give the same person the same thing twice. I can't remember. <laughs> so my memory's pretty weak. Bill, you, you've had a, certainly a, a great life, a long life, and very... I've been honored. Very, I've been very fortunate. And, very, and been very influential in thousands of lives that you've affected. Looking back, how do you hope people will remember Bill Taggart? Well, I hadn't given that any thought, but that maybe he was one that tried to help them. So, kind of that land grant philosophy of service to others, uh, important yeah. in your life. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. But, and I don't mean that to just sound yeah. like goody goody. That's not me. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to leave that impression. Yeah. No, no, and you wouldn't, Bill. What uh, is there anything you know? You we've talked about a lot of different things, and we could probably talk all day. And maybe we need to come back and do this again. What, what would you like to mention? Any comments you'd like to make? Or is, or is there something we missed that you'd like to talk about as we conclude uh, our conversation? I've always enjoyed being a, a humorist of sorts, mm -hmm. kind of a poor one at times, but I think I've learned from the interviewee here, or the interviewer, mm -hmm. that he doesn't know how to count because back about 10 questions ago, <laughs> <laughs> The next two will be the last. That's right. I, I'm not a math major, but a history major. But I've learned that it's in teaching or trying to teach, whether it's in a work session or in church anyway or whatever, sometimes when I've learned to work with audiences and when you begin to see that they're, well, first off, they don't want to hear somebody talk all the time. If you can involve them in the discussion, they're going to go home learning more than if you didn't do that. And then I've learned when sometimes the crowd or the audience gets a little bit tired, some kind of a humorous situation will revive that audience. They think you're going to do it again some more. I <laughs> suppose. Going? I don't know. <laughs> I've learned that. But you learn a lot as you work with people. You have to or you'll never succeed, I don't think. And I think that'd be true with what everyone does. Well, I appreciate it. I, I, you, you call my hand so I can't ask you any more questions. I guess that concludes a bit. I want to thank you for taking the time to, to be here today. And, and you're right, humor does make well, a lot of things you. go better, doesn't it? Okay. Thank you very much. My family will enjoy listening to that.